changes to okay. any communications or are those uh, saved for the regular meeting? Yeah, let's save for the regular meeting. All right. And uh, so we have uh, a couple of presentations tonight. Dr. Finch, would you uh, like to do the honors and introduce our uh, guests this evening? Yeah, the program we have John Fish and Transportation in order, but I believe we have you know, everything set up for Jamie to present for transportation. And I think Stacy's going to do a little intro for us. I am. I am going to play the part of Joe Connolly tonight. He could not be here, but he wanted to introduce um, these two fine directors. So I'm going to read a statement that he has prepared. First, I would like to apologize for my absence tonight, as I had a personal obligation to attend to. I wanted to take a few seconds of your time to recognize the two wonderful directors presenting tonight. Like most departments, they have been hit pretty hard by the pandemic. But their leadership and uplifting approaches to their work have been outstanding. And has, it has allowed our district and their departments to continue to power through these difficult times. Food Services Department, Magellan, has been absolutely amazing and through it all continues to show up with a smile on her face and a we can do this attitude. I would like to point out that I was thoroughly impressed with Magellan, especially in her recent department audit review. Her leadership, positivity, knowledge, and level of performance during that process was truly outstanding. Specifically, her work on designing specified menus for students' dietary needs was praised by the reviewer and was stated to be a model for other districts and review teams. Transportation Department. As you all were well aware at the beginning of the school year, there was plenty of talk around transportation and whether we would, we would have enough bus drivers to make it. Well, I truly believe our district under the leadership of Jamie did an excellent job in a time of great difficulty. Jamie's leadership approach, adaptability, recruiting, and her ability to strive through the daily challenges was instrumental in that success. I believe we only had to implement our bus driver shortage plan a few times. This is a quote I reference frequently from Michael Jordan that perfectly describes the effort and approach these two directors show. Obstacles don't have to stop you. If you run into a wall, don't turn around and give up. Figure out how to climb it, go through it, or work around it. As we know, there were plenty of obstacles thrown their way and they continued to strive and find ways to ensure their department's overall success. In order to be a successful leader, it takes an extraordinary team of employees. So let's hear from each one of them on the respective teams and the amazing employees that make up our nutritional and transportation departments. Well, thank you, Stacy, And thank you, Joe, those were very kind words. Um, my name is Jamie Schmidt. I've been the Director of Transportation here in West Valley uh, since 2018, so I'm just on the downward slide of my fourth year um, here at West Valley. My goals have remained the same. I've, I've had the pleasure of presenting in front of you every year, and uh, I am just trying to continue to develop a strong team. Um, an efficient department with not only transportation staff and district staff, but the community as well. That's very important to me and always has been. Uh, as a department navigating through challenges that we've faced and dealing with the COVID virus, I feel that, that I've been able to meet these goals and so much more, um, not only myself, but as a team. Um, a word that I've been using often this year is perseverance. And the definition of perseverance is persistence in doing something despite difficulty or delay in achieving success. And tonight I'd like to introduce our staff. Um, you guys don't get the privilege of, of meeting our staff and seeing the faces behind transportation. Um, everyone in my staff, but two people in our office are brand new, including our shop mechanics. Uh, new this year. Um, and I'll tell you that some of the challenges we have faced this year and how we have persevered as a team is Everybody has the same vision and the same goals. Uh, it's, it's really important that we share the same values in what we're doing every day. And it's transporting our students to and from safely every single day and everything that it takes to make that happen. 
And I finally feel like in my fourth year there and with these new faces that we've been able to handpick that we finally have what I would want to refer to as the dream team. Um, everybody's learning to be an expert in their field. Um, I'm going to start. I've got some pictures that I'd like you to be able to see. Uh, our office and shop staff. This is this is Darla Dugas. She's our transportation secretary. Um, we've, they've all been retired within the last two years and have only had about a year or less of working together as a team. I'm super proud of this group of individuals and have been excited to watch them each excel. Our transportation secretary, Darla Dugas, continues to excel in her position and is a strong asset to our team. We're in the process of introducing a new mechanical software program that helps track our bus services, repairs, and shop inventory. Dar Darla has been instr instrumental in this uh, in charge and in charge of implementing this program. And with training from the software company, she's doing a fantastic job. She does an impeccable job with uh, not only her, her daily bookkeeping, payroll duties, and most importantly, dealing with the public. Uh, she's always positive. She's soft-spoken. She's kind of the keeper of our calm, is, and I kind of joke with her about that. Darla works very well with not only our district drivers, but our district finance department as well. This last week, Darla, who is a former bus driver from our district, received a message from a rider that she transported 20 years ago. I wanted to share this message because it shows what an impact our drivers can make and, and do make on our students. And I'm just going to briefly read this. It says, hi, Darla, you probably don't remember me, but you were my bus driver about 20 years ago. And I just wanted to let you know that that left a positive impact on my life. And I hope life has been good to you. You used to pick me up on up first on 66th Avenue, and I was really shy. I used to sit in the first seat by you. I just wanted to reach out and let you know that you were important to me that year. Thank you. Uh, that's the kind of impact that our drivers have on a lot of these students where the first face they see in the morning and the last face that they see when they go home at night. And it's, it's a, a positive impact that is important for me to see our drivers make with these students. This is our transportation coordinator, Deborah Boyle. She was officially hired this at the beginning of this year as our transportation coordinator after 31 years as a bus driver. Uh, she's been in, in West Valley all of those years. Deborah works closely with other departments in coordinating transportation for all of our special needs, pre-K and McKenny Vento home. Deborah is cross-trained in many of the daily functions that my role is responsible for, and she is fully capable of making the best decisions in my absence. Uh, I refer to Debbie as kind of my right-hand man. This morning, we were passing through the hall and actually stepped the same way one way, the same way the other way. And it was like, we could dance together. And that's kind of how our days go. We really intertwine and, and work well together as a team. PBIS discipline liaison substitute bus driver, Michelle Stapleton, has taken a load off of school administrators in handling all bus discipline within transportation. This in itself has freed up precious time for our educators and has allowed transportation to be consistent in its wheel of discipline throughout all of our West Valley schools and communication with our student parents. Um, Michelle continues to follow the PBIS system and recognizes bus riders of the week and month. This program and the recognition that these uh, focus on what kids are doing well instead of the negative. The negative is always going to be there, but, but finding things that these kids are doing right and rewarding that behavior is huge to me. And Michelle's done a really, really good job of, of implementing that PBIS and taking it a step further than, than, than most districts do. We really excel at that. And I've had parents call. I know that, that in years past, when I've presented, there's been board members that have received uh, some of those tokens at home as well. Um, so it's, it's just another thing that I can do and that we can do as a team to reach out to the community and keep building that positive reinforcement. Um, Michelle is set up to complete the Washington State OSPI Driver Trainer Program this summer in Vancouver, Washington. This course has unfortunately been canceled two years in a row due to COVID. 
Uh, it's not only affected our department, but the, the entire state in not having enough driver trainers for these, these programs to be able to train our new trainees. Um, so we're, we're excited they're shortening the program this year to a week long instead of two weeks, but they'll have some work that they have to do before they go to class in the summertime. Which leads me to Glenda Berry, who's our new driver trainer. Uh, Glenda uh, Berry was hired at the beginning of the school year and is a state certified driver trainer with over 20 years of experience. Glenda has uh, revamped our driver trainer program and has done an amazing job training our new drivers this year. As of right now, she's also a preschool bus driver in the mornings and the afternoons. And what's nice about that is we're, we're I don't wanna say killing two birds with one stone, but we're getting a driver morning and afternoon and somebody that can work in the middle of the day and train these new, new trainees. She's already trained or is in the process of training seven new drivers, three of which will test next week. And that's huge for our spring sports that'll be coming up. Uh, all of the contracted regular routes are filled and we're building a very successful substitute driver pool. Um, let's see, our shop, transportation shop mechanics. We used to have a Larry Gore and Neil Irwin. Um, they both have retired and we lost 40 plus years of experience in our shop uh, in a very short time. Uh, after uh, conducting interviews, we were fortunate in finding and hiring Kurt Sweezy. Kurt comes to our district with many years of mechanical experience, having previous, previously worked on a fleet of 50 trucks for UPS. Kurt is figuring out his way around the quote unquote yellow bus and has many resources available to him when he has questions. Still having one more full-time uh, position to fill, we hired Mike McIntosh. Uh, he's a longtime diesel mechanic in our valley. Mike also comes with many years of experience. One big challenge that the mechanics have been facing is being able to get bus parts in a timely fashion. Everything is on back order. Um, and many parts have been taking six to eight weeks to be able to obtain. Kurt has spent many hours uh, researching other vendors that we can try to get parts from. One source that he has found to be very helpful is Amazon. Uh, in fact, Amazon has not only had our inventory of many of the needed parts, but a, a much lesser price. And so I've asked Kurt and Darla to keep a spreadsheet of what our normal vendors charge and what Amazon is charging, what our savings is. Uh, so far this year, we've paid about $5,100 ordering from Amazon, and we would have spent 11, a little over $11,000. $11, um, that's a savings of about $5,100 or actually right around 6,000 so far this year for half the year. Um, and the, the bigger part of that is we don't have buses sitting on the line that, that are red chipped. Uh, so it's been very successful. It takes them a little bit of time to research those parts and find what's comparable uh, from the vendor. And then he price shops it and, and it's, it, that part of it's going pretty well. Not able to get everything, but we're keeping our fleet afloat. So that's been helpful. I'm very confident in the work that they are both doing in our shop and feel they're, uh, that they complement each other. Surprise inspection. Uh, and we have our summer inspection scheduled for March 16th and 17th. So they're kind of hitting us back to back, but they were a little late. And I think because of COVID, a little late getting to us for our winter inspections. Transportation only had one out of service bus that was reinspected on the spot and passed inspection. Uh, and we had one in, un, unsatisfactory, which is a minor finding. Um, these results were great, especially for first time inspections for our mechanics and to be unannounced. I was very pleased with those results. I'm uh, very confident that the results for our summer inspections will be up to our usual high standards. Um, Let's see here. I'm going to go back to this one. This is just a picture of some of our drivers. Um, currently, we have 31 contracted drivers and five substitute drivers with three more substitute drivers in training at this very moment. They'll test next week. We've hired nine new drivers since the beginning of the school year. At this time, our district has 82 general education bus routes, 25 special needs routes, and 10 preschool routes. Our district is one of the very few districts in our state that has all of the contracted route positions filled, let alone a substitute driver pool. 
there are many districts, I'm sure as you're all aware, that can't even function on a normal school schedule because they don't have enough drivers to get kids to and from. I don't know what we're doing different, but I feel very blessed to have the group that we have. Um, one other thing I'm working on is having Amy uh, take pictures of our staff this year and setting them up on, a, on the website so that parents can see a face of who's transporting their, their student. I think it's important that these drivers get the recognition that they deserve. And it, it, I think will help parents in the community uh, feel more in touch with, with who's transporting their child, their precious cargo. Um, our fleet, West Valley School District currently has a fleet of 48 buses. We had three buses on order that we've been waiting on since last year. It's taken a tremendous amount of time. We've had our 84 passenger bus delivered. Um, but the other two smaller buses uh, that we are trying to utilize for pre-K and SPED services, the way that we ordered these buses, uh, a pre-K has to be in an integrated harness, a five-point harness, and a, a regular uh, special education student just has the shoulder strap. And in the past, our buses had always been ordered one or the other. And to me, it makes more sense efficiency wise to be able to utilize that bus over the years in different ways to have the two different setups. Um, like everything else due to the COVID pandemic, our industry has had delays in receiving buses in a timely fashion. Transportation was able to sell all three buses at our annual surplus sale this year, which I've never been able to do. We didn't have to scrap anything. And we actually made more money doing it that way than in years past. Those buses had come off depreciation and will continue to add new buses to the fleet and dispose of the older buses as we replace them, continuing to build our transportation vehicle fund. I'm also very excited to let everyone know that we have finally been able to add two new Ford Expeditions to our very old and tired motor pool fleet. They are beautiful vehicles and I'm excited and proud to be able to put our West Valley staff on the road in style and know that they are all safe. Funding, uh, last year due to the COVID virus, coronavirus, we transported an average of 1900 students to and from school each day. The numbers turned into OSP for, OSPI for ridership for the first quarter this year went up to 3,191 and second quarter moved up again to 3,214. Pre-COVID, we were uh, at about 4,200 was about the highest that I turned in. So we're not quite there yet, but I am pleased as to where we're at already. Our department's funding is based off of student ridership. We're about 800 riders away from our pre-COVID numbers. We're looking better than most districts in the state with these numbers, as most districts do not have drivers to fill their regular routes to pick up the kids and are on operating on a shortened schedule due to the driver shortages. Boundary adjustments and rerouting. Our coordinator, Debbie Boyle, and I spent the entire summer setting up the elementary bus stops according to the new elementary boundaries. It was a huge undertaking as we had to drive every new route and look at every single elementary stop to ensure its safety as far as visibility, safe walking areas, and if the county needed to post a bus stop ahead signs. That is something that the city or the county, you call them, um, there's a contact person there, you give them the information and they go out and assess if those signs are needed. We even had the police called on us at one point because we were following a FedEx truck and he thought we were suspicious <laughs> and he called the district office and they called and said, are you out looking at bus stops? I said, yes, we are. <laughs> it also gave me a chance to look at every route and make any changes necessary to ensure that we are running routes as efficiently as possible for our 1,952 general ed bus stops. Uh, the transportation department has overcome so much this year with all of the challenges and restrictions that we have been faced with. I'm so proud of our difficult time. I've been blessed with an amazing team to work with, and I'm looking forward to setting the standard, standard even higher this next year. I feel that the success of our department starts at the top with our school board, with Peter, Joe, and Stacy, the school administrators, and the leadership within transportation. Everyone is focused on building personal relationships that foster a supportive and caring culture, I read a lot about districts around our state and what they are struggling with, and it all seems to come back to support for the bus drivers. 
When issues come up, we problem solve as a team and it starts at the top. Our drivers feel supported. They have some of the best wages in the state and a nice benefits package. And because of these reasons, I feel that is why West Valley School District at this time has one of the most successful transportation departments in the state. I want to personally thank each and every one of you for your support in our department. And, and, and that's heartfelt. Um, with, without your support, we can't do what we're doing. And I do study a lot on that. And there's a lot of transportation departments in our state that don't have support from, from people that are above the drivers. And they know that. And I think that's one of the main reasons why they continue to stick with us. So thank you for that. And, and thank you. That's the end of my presentation. Does anybody have any questions? Um, I, I actually do. Um, it's not on anything that you specifically talked about in the presentation, but, uh, and I and I almost feel a little embarrassed to even ask this question, have, having been on the board as long as I've been, but talk about fuel acquisition for the transportation department. How, how, is that your is that your responsibility for, for the buses? It is. Can you talk about, about I mean, I can. Fuel, fuel costs are on the rise, both gasoline and diesel. Can you talk about how the district goes about and, and uh, procures uh, fuel? Absolutely. Vehicles? We have to go off of a state bid. So whoever has the lowest state bid is who we go with. And so it makes it actually we it makes it really easy because I can just set up with whoever holds our county state bid and I'm guaranteed the, the lesser price on the barrel than any place else because they they put in for that bid. Uh, it used to be that we would have to get three bids go with the lowest one. And since I've, I've been in West Valley, my second year that changed to just going with the flat state bid and your guaranteed lowest price on the barrel. And it is a huge concern and I've watched the prices go up. And um, I do know that um, we are getting to the lowest price. And I, I do kind of check around to make sure that that state bid is, is what they say it is and it's right on the money. And you haven't had any difficulties uh, getting no, the fuel. Just, That's good. No, we did these last few weeks. Oh. They, the, the oil company was hit hard by COVID and couldn't get their drivers out. And it got, I have an alarm set up actually on my computer and phone that alarms me when our uh, tanks hit to a certain percentage. And I, my alarms were going off and I called and I was like, can I get a driver? And they actually two days later had somebody out. I was kind of sweating it, but we got through it. Well, good. Thank you for uh, in, in light. Any other questions? Um, I don't have a question, but I have two comments uh, that I just wanted to say for the edification of the board and the audience. Uh, first of all, Jamie, uh, the thing that I, as a parent, appreciate about you uh, is you are a great listener. Thank you. When you first came to West Valley, um, you, you, we, we had to have an interaction very early on in your ten, in your tenure, and and the thing that struck me about that conversation uh, was your compassion, but your listening and your problem solving skills, and that segued itself to the challenges that we felt faced in the beginning of the year with with the COVID situation and the and the loss of bus drivers and. That could have been a, it, it was a difficult situation that could have been made worse had it not been for your problem solving skills and your initiative to minimize the problem as best as you, as you could, doing the best you, that, using your best judgment as quickly as possible to minimize the disruption to as, as little, as few families as possible. And, and uh, uh, I just like to give my personal thanks and I'm sure the rest of the board shares in this as well. So thank you.
mentioned in the PBIS. So you have, is that an ongoing training with your staff with PBIS? Yes, and actually um, we've been implementing that now three years, I think it is. And I, and I would like to, we, we wanted to two years ago take it a step further and have what, what I would refer to as a prize control program where a fifth or sixth grade student or a fifth grade student that's older riding that elementary bus would buddy up with some of the kids that are struggling uh, perhaps to have them color with them or read a book together and um, help deter that negative behavior. Um, but with COVID hitting, school shutting down, restarting, and then having these seating assignments and different things that are in effect right now, we've been, been unable to implement that. But that is something that I'd like to take a step further. I once attended a, a very good seminar regarding ACEs, and I, I don't know what that acronym stands for. I know you probably do. Um, it was one of the best trainings I've ever been to, and, and what struck me is you don't know what some of these kids are going through at home, and we want to provide them with the most positive experience we can on the bus, and it's important. And every student on that bus deserves to have a positive experience to and from and, and be delivered safely. And all of these little programs that we can introduce that help promote that and being able to show reinforcement, uh, even for the Pride Patrol members, I've got a whole plan that I'd like to implement that involves interviewing some of these kids and you know, treating it like it's their first job and, and recognizing their good work at the end of the year. There's lots of things that we could do to, to make it even uh, better, uh, but we've, we've been unable with COVID to do that right now. So I feel like what we've got in place is pretty good. I would love to find some more training for our drivers to um, to grow that knowledge. I second with this. It's not really a question. It's you're you taking over the discipline, the bus tickets. Yes. As a principal, that was probably one of the more frustrating parts of our job was having to discipline kids and not really knowing for sure why. Uh, the bus driver said so. <laughs> yeah. Basically, what it was, and we always back the bus driver. But for you to take that over, I talked to a, a principal the other night, and they are stressed. And for you to take over that 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 job from them must it, mean an awful lot to those principals. And in, in I hope so. It's a huge undertaking, but I'll tell you, it keeps our discipline consistent with yes. every single student. Um. It, not only consistency, but we have the stake in the game. And, and, and that's one of the things that I'm talking about, supporting our drivers. They need our support. I have a discipline liaison that can hop on a bus and help them, that can call a parent and have that conversation of how can we help Sammy have a, a more productive ride to school? What are some of the ways that, that you would recommend as a parent communicating with your child? They're not in the dark. They know that there's issues. And then if it continues, they're not, they're not caught off guard. And it's including them that I think I think that's really important. And, and I do see where that's lightened the load of the administrators. And I'm very appreciative to have been able to handle that in-house. Thank you. Any other questions? All you right. Guys, when are you guys all going to come and let me teach you how to drive bus? That's what I want to know. <laughs> Just kidding. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Tough act to follow. Dr. Schmidt, would you like to introduce our next uh, speaker, please? All right. Magdalene Benedicto set up here. Uh, with we can see her presentation on the Zoom screen. We also want to have the presentation on the large screen here in person in the library. We are in the library this evening because we have Mr. West Valley dress rehearsal in the auditorium tonight. So we are back to Zoom. It looks like with Jeremy Cox here helping with the technology, we're ready to roll. So Magdalene, go ahead and take it away. Awesome. Well, first off, I want to thank you for this opportunity to present um, in front of you. Um, this is my seventh year as the child nutrition director. Um, just want to say I've just been very blessed to be part of this district. Um, I, I've really enjoyed my job. I love my job. I love 
working with the principals and my my colleagues. So it's been really great um, this last seven years. Um, this school year, I think, has been. I'll just let it out now because I already <laughs> I already cried at the meeting. I, I just want to get it out there. It's been one of the toughest years. It it was much tougher than when COVID hit. Um, I'm sure you've heard of all the uh, supply chain issues and you know labor supply issues. So I'll get into that um, here in my presentation. So I just had to get that out there. All right. Um, let's see. Okay. It's not. Oh, there it goes. All right, so a little about a program. Um, so last school year, we operated the summer meals program, which uh, provided community uh, students or children in our community free meals. Uh, this school year, we transitioned to the seamless summer meals program, uh, which provides free meals to students on campus. Um, this helped our, our program um, increase our funding. Um, support access to the meals for our students on site and balance operational needs with the goal of providing nutritious meals. Um, we've been able to provide, again, meals at no charge um, by operating the seamless summer option, uh, receiving the highest summer meals reimbursement rate uh, versus the national school lunch program rates. Um, so, let's see. okay, I think I got it. A little off centered. Thank you, Jerry. That works. Thank you. Okay, a little bit about our program. So we have a centralized kitchen located at High, and we um, have nine satellite kitchens. We have about 35 child nutrition employees currently. Uh, we have five cooks that uh, pre prepare the meals at the centralized kitchen at the junior high. Um, we prepare up to 1,200 breakfast meals and 2,800 lunch meals each day. Uh, menu planning. So last year, um, we were able to provide a simplified lunch menu. However, we transitioned back to the USDA meal pattern, uh, nutrition standards, um, which is the school breakfast program and national school lunch program. These menus are uh, food based menu planning approach for all age groups. Uh, menus are developed to meet daily and weekly uh, meal servings based on the five food components. So the whole grains, meat, meat alternatives, uh, fruits, vegetables, and fluid milk. Um, and also we need to make sure we're meeting the weekly nutrient requirements um, such as calories, uh, saturated fat, and sat, uh, sodium. Um, also each menu is age, is age appropriate. So I have a menu for our elementary students, K through five, I have a menu for our middle level students, six to eight, and our high school students, nine to 12. Um, also, like Joe uh, mentioned in his introductory, I've uh, developed special dietary menus uh, back in 2019 that I'm really proud of. So, uh, you know, we, we started off maybe serving nine students with specialized diets. Now we're serving over, I think, 30 plus students with special diets whether they're gluten-free, uh, dairy-free, egg-free, and lactose-free. So, you know, when I've talked to the parents, they're just, they're just really excited that, you know, their students can't eat school meals um, and gives them a good sense of assurance that we're providing them a safe meal at school. Also, um, this year we brought back the offer versus serve. So last school year, we were packaging every meal. We, um, Everything was in a bag, uh, but this year we came back and did the offer, offer versus serve provision, which means um, students can come through the lunch line. There's a salad bar at every single school. Uh, the offer versus serve is only required at the high school level. However, we've implemented it at each elementary school, each middle level school and high school. Um, they go through the salad bar. We have at least two fruits, two vegetables, a variety of fruit, uh, milk options for them to choose from.
Uh, okay, so our menus, our monthly menus features, again, whole grain rich products, lean meats, low fat cheeses, fat free white and chocolate milk. And also we have soy milk and lactose free milk. Um, we offer a variety of fresh fruits and vegetables daily consisting of over 50% fresh produce. Um, a few things I wanna highlight about our menu. Um, I, a little background about me. So we have a farm, uh, family operated farm down in the lower valley. And that picture is, is my baby <laughs> taken last, last summer. So the days that I'm off over the summer is not vacation days. It's actually working on the farm. <laughs> so a little bit about myself. So this farm to school program is really dear um, to my heart because you know, we want to support the local farmers in Washington state. We are central of all these abundance of fruits and vegetables and definitely want to bring that um, to our schools, um, educate our students about what, where a tomato comes from, where watermelon comes from, where sweet corn comes from, not from a can. It's, there's actual corn um, fields. Uh, so definitely want to educate our students about that um, and then bring in more fresh fruits and vegetables. Also variety of options. So uh, I host um, a Central Washington Directors Meeting. I'm, I'm the lead on uh, those meetings, and we do all, you know we talk a lot. We share our thoughts and ideas. And a lot of the schools, because of COVID, they went switched over to two weeks menu cycle. So every two weeks, it's the same items every two weeks. However, we've done a great job. Um, or continue our four-week menu cycle. So every four weeks, it's different options. I mean, you'll still see chicken sandwich and pizzas almost every day because the students like that's all they want. But we've done a really good job um, at, at adding variety to our menus um, and also scratch meat items. Um, just recently, I had a meeting with the local directors, and a lot of them are talking about, oh, we're just we're just starting to make scratch meat items. Well, we've been doing that since October. So that's um, something I'm really proud of. And our, our team just, you know, we, when I when I brought out the menus are like, oh, finally, we can start making cheese zombies. We can start making turkey gravies. So my team was really excited. And I think they were tired of all the individually wrapped items. Again, offer versus serve. So breakfast, um, we typically have two menu options, um, a hot, hot item and cereal, um, choice of 100% fruit juice or whole fruit, um, and then three milk options. Um, again, we have the offer versus serve provision at all our elementary schools where they can select what they wanna eat or decline any, any of the food items. Uh, secondary schools, we have at least four menu options at breakfast. And then again, 100% fruit juice, if we get them, or whole fruit. Um, just a little bit about the whole fruit. So we, we uh, procured local apples. We actually get apples from Highland Fruit. Um, and they told us the apple trees that were across the administration building um, are probably apples we've eaten in our district. So that uh, was pretty cool to um, see. Uh, let's see. Uh, offer versus, versus serve at lunch. So at lunch, um, so last school year when students were uh, served the summer meals program, they only had one menu option. Uh, this year we, we brought in one to two menu options um, at the elementary schools. We brought back the salad bar as soon as school started. Um, of course, making sure we're, we're following safety protocols, changing out the utensils um, between uh, meal services. Um, we have at least four fruits and vegetable options on the salad bar and uh, three milk options. At the secondary schools, we uh, from day one, we've offered four to five menu options. Uh, again, their salad bar, they have a variety of fruits and vegetables that they can choose from, and then three milk options. So there's a couple pictures of our uh, West Valley school lunch. So the first one is turkey gravy. Um, so again, the whole, whole apple on the picture is from Highland Fruit Growers. Chocolate milk, uh, we procured 
uh, about three years ago, um, which was part of a purchasing co-op. Uh, so we purchased them from Springbrook Farms. The apples or applesauce, green beans, and turkey gravy, those are all USDA commodity items. And then the turkey gravy and homemade rolls. So those are all scratch made, homemade from our central uh, kitchen. <clears throat> Um, next one is a uh, West uh, chicken teriyaki plate. Uh, so again, the chocolate milk that was procured and from Springbrook Farms, uh, mixed berry cup that is a commodity item, and then chicken teriyaki is also a commodity item. Um, and so we just made up the teriyaki sauce from scratch, mix it up with the chicken, and there it is, chicken teriyaki rice bowl. <laughs> Okay, so free and reduced rates. Um, this school year, as with the summer, seamless summer option, we weren't required to um, process free and reduced application, but I know how important it is for our district to continue that process. Um, so this year we received 500, or we processed 564 applications, uh, 630 students were eligible for free and reduced based on the applications. Also, um, 1,692 students were directly certified for free or reduced meals based on either SNAP, um, like Washington State uh, Benefits Programs, uh, SNAP, SNAP, TANF, Migrant, uh, Foster Care, and Medicaid Benefits. So right now we are sitting at 50, this is as of January, 50% as a district. So that is, I mean, we went from 44% um, back in 2019. I think last year was about 44 to 46, and now we're at 50%. Uh, we did see a jump um, on the amount of direct certified students. So we're seeing, you know, a lot of families are now applying for state benefits. So when, you know, when they apply, they become eligible for free or reduced meals. <clears throat> Magdalene, if I could jump in. Yeah. So really appreciate all the staff working with the child nutrition. free reduced meal rate, because even though we're serving all students, mm -hmm. many of the other programs in the district are based the funding on Absolutely. the free and reduced meal rate. So the learning assistance program is one of those pro, uh, programs mm -hmm. that are based on that rate. And then a, the high poverty funds for the lear, lear, learning assistance program as well. Mm -hmm. So all of these, <clears throat> um, this extra work uh, is actually providing additional funds, which provides additional services for kids that need those services in our district. So I appreciate your work on that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, uh, student participation. So as of um, today, we're serving about 900 average breakfast meals per day, which is higher uh, than pre-COVID. So I just based it off of pre-COVID numbers. Uh, lunch, we're trending to about 2,800 average lunch meals per day. So participation is um, higher with the free meals. I know for breakfast, there's a lot of limitations. Um, like elementary schools, students can't come in to the building until maybe 10 to 15 minutes before school even starts. So that, you know, that gives students, what, 10 minutes to get to the lunchroom, grab, grab a breakfast, and then either eat it in the cafeteria or take it to the to the uh, classroom. So I would like to see these numbers much higher, but I mean, I understand there's, there's different things that, that we, the schools, um, different decisions based on the schools. So if we can work on that, that's one thing that I'd like to work on and see how we can work together in increasing breakfast participation. Because I mean, you've, you've heard research shows that breakfast is one of the most important meals of the day, and it gives these students the energy to get through their school day. So if we can work on that, that would be great. Okay, so fiscal information. So we are, um, Child Nutrition is self-operated. Uh, we bring in funds based on these four items. So local, which are, well, when students were paying for their meals, um, they would add money to their lunch accounts. Um, state funds, so state assistance and co-pays for free and reduced meals. Um, also our federal 
reimbursement. So every meal that we serve on site, we get reimbursed for those meals. So it's not every meal that we prepare, it's every meal that we serve to students. So that there's a huge difference there. I don't think that's one thing I, I would really like to educate um, parents and teachers. Um, and a lot of teachers do a great job and hey, make sure, make sure we get a reimbursable meal. That way, you know, that's how we are funded. So definitely working on um, educating on that. Um, also non-program revenue. So last year we couldn't do any catering because of there was no meetings. Um, vending machines or vending machines were all turned off. So we, we've slowly started in, um, starting our catering um, and vending machines, um, also a la carte purchases at school. So we're getting some revenue from non-program non -program, non revenue. Uh, expenditure, so these are just percentages. Um, one thing I wanna highlight, here, uh, labor and benefits. Usually, we want to see it forty, about forty-five uh, to fifty percent. So we're within that range. Um, I know back in 2020, 18 of my staff that are part time now receives uh, benefits because of the sub program, uh, which is great. I mean, I'm really happy that our staff um, are able to receive free benefits, but that really put a toll in my. Uh, my my budget um, because it's a thousand dollars for each employee each month. So this is our um, carryover information. So back in 2020, 2021, so last school year, we were in the deficit of, in about two hundred thousand dollars, which was expected. We had low participation rates because because of COVID, we didn't have any students on site. Um, our curbside um, meal distribution wasn't, it was really hard for parents to come in and pick up meals. So we had low participation there. Um, we had increased supply expenditures. Um, we purchased items that were non-traditional for our meal service program, such as poly bags, food bins, um, storage containers also increased labor expenditures due to the multiple meal services. We had curbside meal service, we had meals in the classroom, um, and then assembling those meals took a lot of time. Um, however, you know, we're still working on staying within budget. I think this school year will, will be our breaking point. Um, definitely utilizing the entitlement funds, we get about 170 dollars to $185,000 a year. Um, to utilize um, in, for commodity foods, USDA direct deliveries, Washington's processed um, products, and also we're part of the Puget Sound Joint Co-op purchasing. Um, also, we are the lead agency for some, the Central Washington Interlocal Co-op um, in produce, dairy, ready to serve pizza, and fresh baked goods. So I appreciate the support there. Uh, and so this upcoming school year, we'll have to rebid for again, produce, dairy and bread. So we'll be, I've been working on that. I decided stay as the lead agency just because I have all the documentation. It, it's, I, I really enjoy the procurement process. So I, I'm, I'll continue that with the other uh, <coughs> districts. Uh, so again, program challenges. The main one is food shortages. Um, there's, we get food deliveries every Wednesday. There's days when half of our load in and we, our team worked hard in, you know, finding substitutions. I have a warehouse manager and she knew our warehouse, the ins and outs. She found substitutions. I don't know where from, but we were able to still continue feeding our students without, you know, sometimes they had a chicken shortage um, back in October, but we, we still found, found ways to feed our students. Labor shortage, um, gosh, there was one time where we only had one cook out of our five, but my team pulled through without complaints. He said, actually, they've, they made all the decisions, hey, we can do this, this, and this, and they took it on. And so I'm really proud of um, my production managers and production team. Uh, paper supply shortages. So again, foam trays, bowls, cups, 
Um, we've had to utilize uh, hinged containers, cut the containers in half and utilize that for school lunches. Um, but thankfully right now we're, the manufacturers are finally catching up and we're, we're finally starting to get supply. Um, again, program challenges, um, equipment part shortage. <laughs> so Cottonwood, we bit has dishwasher has been out of commission since last spring. We're waiting on one one part, one small part, and we still haven't been able to get it. So we can't use the dishwasher. Um, I've ordered items back in November that has even came in. Uh, so that's really taking a toll in our department. Decreased revenue again from no catering sales, a la carte sales, um, and vending machine sales. Um, also increasing costs for food and supplies. Just an example, recently um, I purchased reusable trays. Back in November, they were $42.99. I tried reordering more trays. The cheapest I can find is $88 for that exact same tray. So definitely, I mean, that's just one, one thing. Um, that that just recently happened. Um, we're seeing that with equipment, beef products, chicken products, cheese products. Um, okay, so program highlights. Again, school meals are healthy and important. Um, when I make my my school visits, kitchen visits, I mean these these students are loading up with fruits and vegetables. You know, research says they they get students that participate in lunch programs. They get the most of the fruits and vegetables and whole grains at school. So they, they definitely load up on their fruits and vegetables and hopefully they're eating it in the cafeteria. Um, farm to school efforts again, we're, I'm part of a WSDA farm to school institute cohort. Um, again, that's my goal in um, bringing in more local Washington grown products, um, special dietary accommodations, we're able to you know, feed students that have any special dietary needs or intolerances. Um, and then again, we just had our OSPI administrative review. They were in here for a whole week. Um, they looked at our December menus. They looked at uh, a week in January um, and they found minor issues. So really proud of that. Um, again, procurement efforts. Um, will be, again, the lead agency for our interlocal agreement. Uh, right now we have eight school districts. Um, however, we're, we're, we have a couple other school districts are, that are interested in joining our interlocal agreement. Um, so we'll start bidding for new contracts next school year uh, for milk, fresh produce, and baked goods. Um, also the ecology law, this came out of nowhere. So we found out in November that we had to switch from our sport kits, this is really important to the kids, so I had to add this on. So instead of our sport kits at elementary schools, we had to cut those out um, and only use single serve serviceware. So we have to serve individual spoons, forks, napkins, straws. Um, the whole objective of that is just to reduce waste. So like if you go to, just automatically give you a lid. And that's if you want it. Um, so we transitioned um, just last month. And then um, in, by 2024, we'll have to eliminate all polycysterine foam trays, foam bowls from our program and start re using reusable trays. Um, a couple, so we received a couple grants this school year, um, the Safe School Meals Grant, which was about $14,000. Um, this helped us purchase the reusable trays, food storage containers, hot carts, and staff training, and also grant uh, the farm to school grant um, for $36,000. So that will definitely help um, purchase the local apples that we're getting from Highland Fruit Growers. Okay, and lastly, prog program goals. Uh, first one is just to ob obtain and encourage acceptance of our child nutrition department as an integral part of the educational program. So again, just want to educate the community about the child nutrition program, what we can <coughs> offer, the services we have, um, promoting nutrition and learning and departmental communication, 
um, bring back taste testings in the classroom. I really miss going into the classroom, just engaging with the students, educating them on what our school meals are. A student-centered environment conducive to healthy eating habits and social interactions. You know, working with our students, sending out surveys. What do they want to eat? What's what's what are some reasons why they're not eating school meals? And hopefully that can help with participation. Um, and then develop a marketing plan to promote the positive images of child nutrition program. Uh, there's a lot of positive things that we do in our department. We I just don't do a good job promoting it. So definitely want to do that. Um, promote our farm to school efforts, our scratch made recipes, our allergen free menus um, and taste testings. Um, and then this is my last slide. So again, just continue replacing old equipment using grant funds, um, improve layout and design of serving lines with new smarter lunchroom presentations and then continue um, interlocal co-op bid contracts for best pricing. Okay. That's, that's all, 10 o'clock. Any questions? Um, Madeline, um, the percent of applications for free and reduced lunch, mm -hmm. um, pre-COVID to now COVID times, or is it about the same number that we're getting in, or is it is it a reduced number because of the the free breakfast and lunch for kids? Actually, we um, we processed about a hundred more applications this school year. I know um, we worked with middle level uh, Richard Pryor, so they they did an awesome job. They took on the the calling of parents. Hey, can you fill out this application because they're so close to that 50% mark. So we did see an increase this school year. I think the start of the year, it kind of, we weren't getting those applications, but we really did a push um, mid-November to get those applications. And in future years, when we're moving out of these times, um, is there a plan to, to get a larger percentage of those in? Yes. Um, so we, we, it's a lot more work at the start of the year, but we mail out an application to every, every household in our district. We also um, have an online application system that is really easy for families and a lot of families love it. So we, I have a secretary that does a lot of training with the parents to fill out those applications. So that's really helped us out a lot. And I know um, there is a bill that we're trying to push so Washington State can create an online um, application that would have different languages. Right now we can do Spanish and English, but if this bill passes, we'll have 80 plus, I mean, it's, it's all languages. So I think that would help us out, out a lot as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Couple of things. Uh, at the elementary, I saw where some of you in Apple Valley have the reusable trays. The rest of them don't, I assume. Are the rest of them set up so that in 2024 they have dishwasher so they can use the reusable trays? No. <laughs> so the Apple Valley Infinite View, they have conveyor um, conveyor dishwashers. The other schools have the single door dishwasher. So that's one thing that we'll have to really look into is plus potentially purchasing conveyor um, dishwashers. I have talked to other districts and some districts have the single door and they're able to, to get those dishes done. You know, some, some of them serve two, 300 students at a time. And I wanna see how it's done, but definitely go out. I can go and visit those schools and see how it's done. Second one. Are the lunches going to be free forever, or is this just during COVID? Or something? Right now, it's COVID. Um, we have not heard from USDA what their plans are for next school year. Okay. Usually, they make that decision when right before school starts. So I don't know when that'll be. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Magdalen. Um, Two great presentations, and, and we appreciate uh, uh, both of your work. Uh, uh, 
I often say, say about school, it takes a tremendous effort to pull school off every day. And we heard two wonderful and integral programs for the district and uh, we're very well served. So thank you very much to both of you for your presentations. And with that, that uh, concludes the study session at 7.04. We'll take, a, uh, we'll take about a 10 minute recess uh, 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 between now and the uh, start of the regular meeting. So we'll uh, reconvene uh, after a brief recess at 7.15 to start the regular meeting. Thank you. Hey, me.
Yeah, I'm going to unmute. I'm going to unmute myself for the attendees. Sorry about that. It is 7.15 on uh, Tuesday, the 22nd of February. Uh, thank you for your patience uh, as we uh, concluded two uh, very informative uh, presentations during our study session. So I'll call the uh, regular meeting uh, to order and uh, I'll call it to order with the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready, begin. Okay, um, first, first order, I'd like to uh, make a motion to excuse uh, Mark Strong from meeting tonight. And I'll, uh, so I've made the motion. <laughs> uh, I'll make, I've made the motion and I'll call for a vote. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 4-0 to excuse Mr. Strong. Next up, uh, changes to the agenda. Yes, uh, if we look at the travel uh, request, action nine, we actually have on letter A, we had one for the band to go to the state tournament. Then number three, we had uh, another request to go to the state tournament, but unfortunately our both our teams will not be going to the state tournament. So we can withdraw one and three. In addition, we do have opportunity with JRTC. Uh, they've been invited for a travel request to East Valley, which would be an overnight stay. And so we're going to add JRTC March 11th and 12th of 2022, and that'll be a trip to East Valley with an overnight stay. But East Valley, Spokane, overnight. Actually, I believe it is actually just East Valley of, of Yakima. Uh, Yakima, but they're invited to have an overnight overnight stay with all the other groups that are staying there. So there's really no cost because it's overnight at the at the site, but a chance to have that. Um, just to you know have an overnight with all the other groups that are coming from all over to do the overnight okay then another change of the agenda for communications I'd like to add I'd like to move the public comment to c we'll add b that'll be a chance for clayton wyckoff to update the board about enforcement of the high school dress code so that's after b after a we'll go a bus driver b Dress code and C response to public comment. Okay. All right. Um, so then moving on to communications. All right. So item A is bus driver appreciation. So it is actually today is bus driver appreciation day. Uh, we really appreciate the bus drivers, we appreciate our transportation director, Jamie Schmidt, and her presentation during uh, the uh, study session that we had and then Stacy Drake had organized something uh, a little surprise for the bus drivers as well and I think she delivered those this afternoon so appreciate Stacy and her thoughtfulness for getting something for each of the bus drivers so we just wanted to recognize our bus drivers especially today being bus driver appreciation day all right next B uh, we had I talked to Danny Knudsen and she was going to share her concerns about the dress code. I wanted to have the board have a chance to hear from one of the high school administrators about the enforcement of the high school dress code. So Clayton Wyckoff, assistant principal is here this evening and he's gonna share some information with the board. All right, I can do this. Uh, as I was <clears throat> saying, excuse me, uh, briefly, uh, I just want to, we have a dress code. Our dress code is in the student handbook posted online. Uh, when there's an issue with the dress code, when it comes to our attention, we deal with it. That, that's, the, that's the quick and skinny of it. You know, teachers let us know, we deal with it. About three or four years ago, we actually had a committee got together and we had some, some very um, vocal staff members uh, that thought our, our dress code was very inequitable. Because when you look at any dress code around, 
the only people it's addressing are young ladies, and, uh, except for, you know, drugs and alcohol and guns on shirts, things like that. But, uh, you know, bra straps and midriff and, and four inches above the knees and stuff like that. So we did have a committee of people look at that. Uh, I would say it, it, it drastically changed a few years ago. But as of right now, when there's an issue and we find out about it, we deal with it. All right, very good. Any questions from the board for Mr. Wyckoff? Yeah, how do you deal with it? Well, that's, that's a tricky situation. We have one female administrator. Things like that that you know it's they they wear them it's learning so yeah we deal with it typically we have a we have a staff t-shirt most times kids have a sweatshirt or something to put on over it and they deal with it so last thing we want to do is send a kid home miss out on school get them close come back to school so you have assistant principal fucking juror Yes. Yeah, for yeah. work with the student on that. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Right. Anything else for Clayton? Have you, uh, in terms of uh, a complaint, uh, you know, I, I'm assuming it's another staff member that addressed me that brings it forward to the administration. So, uh, and obviously, this is not a fair question. Would, I mean, is 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 that is that more prevalent this year? Not as prevalent in the past. You know, is it? It's a non-issue. It's an it's a non-issue. Non-issue. So dress code, dress code issues are, are, are not very few and far between. Few and far between. Few and far between, yes. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Clayton. Thank you. All right, next is response to public comment. And so I have a statement here that I'll read. Uh, during the public comment section at the school board meeting on February 8th, community members asked for more information about the high school activity that was developed for RAM on the high school advisory period for the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. observance and the improvement of school culture. The high school leadership class had gained feedback from students about school culture. The students identified harassment, intimidation, and bullying as a focus, specifically the harassment, intimidation, and bullying of students who identify as LGBTQ. The high school ASP advisor found resource materials online to assist with education during Ramstrong to clarify respect for students for their preferred pronouns. Currently on your driver's license, you can choose the following for your gender identification, M for male, F for female, and X for other. The purpose of the activity for Ramstrong was to educate high school students about these changes in our society. And the goal was to ensure that all students are free from harassment, intimidation, and bullying, and that all students feel a sense of belonging and respect at school. All right, next is a program presentation. All right, so we have Gerilyn Ashbaugh as our coordinator for state and federal programs with the district. That's quite a lot under her responsibility with both the state and the federal. Tonight, we're gonna have a program regarding our transitional bilingual instructional program. And that actually does have funding from both state and federal. So the state is the transitional bilingual instructional program funding and the federal is title three. So title three of the uh, ESEA, the elementary secondary education act that's federal funds. So both the state and federal funds are used to support English language learners in our district. And Gerilyn Ashbaugh will share what our program is and how we've been making improvements over time. Great, thank you. I'm excited to be here tonight to share about our transitional bilingual instructional program in West Valley School District. If I can enter. Ah. It's not going. Oh, oh, let's go back. Hold on just a second. Okay. Um, all right. The state transitional bilingual um, program and the federal title IV, as Peter said, addresses the unique um, unique parts of the eligible students who come from these linguistically, culturally diverse backgrounds 
both programs share the same goal, and that is to develop language proficiency that enables them to have meaningful grade level um, curriculum and instruction access. Um, in state law, TBIP or Transitional Bilingual is a program within Washington's Basic Education Act. It, sub it supports supplemental instruction and services for language acquisitions for our multilingual students. The state Transitional Bilingual Program places a strong emphasis on cultural values. Its mission, English language learners, meet state standards and develop language proficiency in an environment where language and cultural assets are recognized as valuable resources for learning. There we go. Um, so eligible students are students who, um, when they enroll in the student, their family marks their home language survey as them having another language other than English as their first language or the language that is spoken most in the home or um, there's a third one and I apologize, it's just escaped me. Um, students who exit or are who are transitioned out of program are students who have been served and uh, then have tested proficient on the English language proficiency assessment. Um, this year, that's a new assessment for you that'll for them that I'll tell you a little bit more about. Uh, primary language means the language most often used by the student uh, uh, for communication in the home. And then transitional bilingual instruction, there's a couple of different meanings. Um, we have programs where students, we don't have them personally, but there are some programs where students receive instruction in both their native language and in, in English. However, in West Valley, uh, we use uh, English to instruct our students. So an alternative instructional model um, that helps and you might include English as their second language and it's designed to enable them to achieve competency in English. I kind of muddled that, but keep going. Um, we've accomplished some awesome goals this year. So one thing that we do in our department is we're looking at each program um, and doing kind of an internal comprehensive program review. So we're looking at if we were to be audited with the state, what would they audit us on and are we there yet? And so we're constantly um, reevaluating where we're at and making sure we're in line with all those compliance standards that they have for us. Um, so we've done that with the transitional bilingual program and we have made really great improvements at the beginning of this year. So I did that last year. At the beginning of this year, we looked at our budget. We wiped the slate clean. We looked at what the state was asking for, from us, um, which were some changes in the program, increased um, designated English language development for our students. And we've achieved that. So I'm super excited about these services that our students are getting now. Um, we're continuing to build awareness of the needs of our multi multilingual learners, both from that English language development perspective. So that intentional instruction around English language development, and then also meaningful access to the content in the classroom. How are they able to access that content? What are our teachers doing to help support them in the classroom? And then a big one this year was we have almost completed the transition to the WIDA screener and the WIDA access testing. Um, for years prior to this, we've done the ELPA, the English Language Proficiency Assessment, uh, ELPA 21. This was a huge undertaking for the district, for um, the support staff, the test administrators, and a new test for our students. Um, so we are on the fifth school out of 10. So we're working our way through that test window. What do we value? Um, transitional bilingual program values belonging and access. How can students come into our schools and into our programs and feel like they belong? And how can we make sure they're getting access to the resources and the content um, that are um, beneficial to them? We look at assets based. Uh, what are their funds of knowledge? What are they bringing into the classrooms with them that we can tap into to help support their learning and their growing? Uh, we value their English language proficiency and their home language. And we also value that career and college ready um, outcome. So a nice quote here, one language sets you in a corridor for life. Two languages opens every door along the way. Research shows that multilingual students or individuals um, have a lot of brain activity happening, right? They have flexible thinking and problem solving skills. Um, it aids in their social emotional adjustment. It ties them to their family culture. 
and it aids in future endeavors in the global economy. So we value multilingualism. Uh, we want our students to hold on to that. All right, so table of contents here. So I'm gonna walk you through a little bit of the process. Um, the first one is identification and monitoring. How are our students identified? Two is our staff. We have a lot of staff involved in uh, serving our multilingual students. What's our approach? What are the best practices for multilingual and where are we headed with this program? So the identification process, like I stated earlier, um, the home language survey is the first step. When families enroll their student in West Valley or any school in the state, they fill out a home language survey. And if they indicate another language other than English, the student is given the WIDA screener now within the first 10 days of their attendance in the school. Uh, that WIDA screener determines whether or not um, they are um, in need of services. So it looks at their reading, writing, listening, and speaking. And if they qualify, then they are placed um, in designated English language development programs. Um, oftentimes that, and I'll go a little bit more into this in a minute, oftentimes that happens in the classroom, but at the secondary level, it really happens in an additional class. So they have a class um, that is designated for ELD. Um, we progress monitor along the way. We look at grades, we look at um, teacher input. Uh, so we're constantly monthly, if not more, looking at how are they doing? Are they progressing? How can we support them? Uh, the WIDA, the annual WIDA access test, the window this year was March 31st through March 20, I'm sorry, January 31st, second. Again, like I said, we're halfway through and that really is a huge undertaking. Um, a lot of time and energy is going into that. So um, we're excited to be halfway through. Um, on this, this is just a nice little graphic that, graphic that kind of talks about English learners in the United States. 10% uh, of public school students in the K-12 are English language learners. Three states with the highest EL numbers are California, Texas, and Florida. Um, lots of ELs enrolled in K-12 public schools. Over 400 languages um, are represented in the United States. With, uh, we have a 70% graduation rate United States-wide or nationwide. And most ELs are born in the US and are citizens. I think that's an interesting uh, fact for us. In West Valley, we have 432 multilingual learners currently registered, and we have eight languages represented. So um, working really hard to communicate with our families around with all of those languages, um, in order to keep, help give the families access to their students' education as well. It's really important to us. Uh, who serves our students? This is our staff. We have uh, kindergarten through fifth grade, we have transitional bilingual paraprofessionals and classroom teachers. So again, at the elementary level, level that may, might look different for different kids in different buildings. Some of those English language development groups are happening in the classroom with their teacher. Some of them are doing a pullout with a Parapro in consultation with an instructional coach and our multilingual uh, instructional coach, Rebecca Festa, in consultation with her. Um, they also then have the meaningful access to content with their classroom teachers. Grades six through 12, we were able to add two sections of designated ELD at the middle level campus this year, and then five sections, say five sections, I'm sorry, at the middle level campus and two at the high school. So our students aren't only getting uh, meaningful access to content in the classroom with their teachers, but they're getting that really intentional instruction around language development that, um, that they need. And again, uh, Rebecca Festa, multilingual instructional coach is available to all of our teachers and our parapros and, and does work with them on a regular basis to improve um, services to our students. Now, our approach, um, it's what I believe, every student, every day, whatever it takes. And we really wanna focus on relationships. Getting to know our students is at the core of everything we do in education and getting to know their assets and the things that they bring with them is really, really important. So again, English language development is a piece of our approach as well. And then also GLAD, SIOP and UDL. So GLAD is our guided language acquisition. Many of our teachers have been 
uh, trained in GLAD. Uh, in, fa in fact, a vast majority of our elementary teachers have had that training um, and utilize that in the classroom. Uh, we also use sheltered instruction observation protocol. And then universal design for learning is kind of the up and coming uh, modality for meeting students where they are, giving them lots of different ways to show what they know um, and to receive that information as well. So the first one, designated English language development. What does that look like? So uh, it's defined as instruction provided during a time in their regular school day for focused instruction on the state adopted English language development standards to assist English learners to develop critical English language skills necessary for academic content learning in English. So at the elementary level, that might look like, or it should look like, uh, wonders in K-1. So our, our reading curriculum in kindergarten and first grade is wonders. And we have specific components in wonders and in journeys grades two through five that address language development. So we have link, a language development piece. We have foundational literacy pieces, academic language, scaffolded language production, and scaffolded comprehension within that curriculum. Yeah, at the secondary level, we've adopted READ 180, um, which is research-based English language development approved. So uh, our students in our ELD classes use that as well. It, com it consists of whole group instruction, small group with the teacher, student application online, independent reading and formative uh, and summative assessments along the way. This should be happening in every classroom. Um, again, we do that through GLAD strategies. GLAD is a great program for that guided language acquisition is a great program for helping students access the content in the classroom. So lots of pictures, lots of vocabulary development, um, sometimes a more of a broad thematic aspect. So they might have lots of different strategies or a teacher might be implementing one strategy um, that really ties into their lesson. Sheltered instruction observation protocol is a nice bank of strategies that works as well. Rebecca Festa, our multilingual instructional coach will be, uh, tra be trained as a trainer of trainers this spring and will re really be able to kind of increase the opportunities for our teachers around that. And then of course, uh, universal design for learning. It's excite really excited to see that on the state's um, information going out around what are some positive programs or, or ways to serve our students in meaningful access to content. So for meaningful access to content, our language specialist or instructional coach uh, will sometimes uh, plan with the core teacher and look at that academic language and expectations and really work to help them scaffold the learning for our multilingual students. Um, again, using GLAD, SIOP, or UDL, um, will focus on the most critical academic language functions and it's driven by the content standards and the content learning objectives of the lesson. Um, a multilingual coach may co-plan or co-teach with the content teachers. Uh, the core content teacher holds often holds the appropriate endorsement or training. And again, that training might be a GLAD training or a PSYOP training or just that collaboration with the coach. Job embedded. In our district, uh, we have two GLAD trainers that are trainers of trainers. So they actually will be uh, facilitating some GLAD trainings for our teachers. We are planning one right now. It's a two day at the end of April. Uh, Jesse Goldbeck, uh, instructional coach at Mountain View and Jen Dinner, a teacher at Cottonwood, I believe she's still at, um, will be facilitating that. So we're really looking forward to getting those trainings started up again and having that in-house um, as well. Again, SIOP, uh, Rebecca's been SIOP trained, but she's, getting that trainer of trainers so she can really facilitate and lead some, some good trainings. Um, and I asked Kenneth Garcia, an eighth grade student um, from the Innovation Center to join us. I have known Kenny since fifth grade and I just wanted to share his story. I wanted him to share his story. Come on up, Ken. So I'm going to just ask him a couple of questions that he and I have talked about. So Kenny, you're an eighth grader, right? Okay, so I want you to start by just telling um, everyone 
when you first started in West Valley, what experiences helped to make you feel welcome in West Valley? Nice and loud. Well, when I entered the building at the middle school, I was welcomed by students, the students' leaders. And I asked one of them a question because I didn't know about the school. And one of them speak Spanish and told me to go to the office with Ms. Bolin. She gave me a buddy who was gonna help me find my classes and even tell me some words that I didn't understand and the school and I'm sorry. Uh, also, Ms. Bolin guided me a lot. She helped me to introduce me to other teachers. And every time I had a question, I used to go with her because she was in the school. She helped me a lot. Awesome, great. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that you felt welcome. Um, what teachers, what did teachers do to help you access the content, to help you, how did they support you in class? One of them gave me a Google Translate tool to understand the languages, both languages. Uh, the Google Translate tool helped me to translate English to Spanish so I can understand what English words were in Spanish and that helped me a lot. Also, I had a lot of tools like Read 180, iReady, and Imagine Learning that helped me in the classroom. I had my language support class that has stations that helped me a lot through learning, reading books, and speaking out loud. Excellent. Thank you. That was actually kind of my next question, what reading, writing, listening, and speaking programs helped you work toward your English proficiency? So sounds like Read 180 was big. I, I believe Imagine Learning, you were talking into the computer, practicing complete sentences with lots of detail, um, that kind of thing. Awesome. Um, did you speak English when you started in West Valley? Uh, no. Okay. No. And how long did it take you to become proficient in the language, in English? I will say three years. Uh, three years to test proficient in English. Um, would you say you're a hard worker? Uh, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> he is an eighth grader. <laughs> nice job. Is there anything else that you would like to like us to know about you that you can think of? Uh, not too much. Not too much. <laughs> but, uh, I will tell you that the teachers at West Valley helped me a lot. They're great teachers. Ms. Grinch, Ms. Ashba, and Ms. Stiles were one of the best teachers that I had, and Ms. Bolin was the best staff in the building too. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. He's now at the Innovation Center, which is where my office is, and he often stops by and just chats or says hi or something like that. So I enjoy that. Awesome. All right. So the next one is West Valley's long-term ELL st statistics. So Students who have been in program for five years or more are considered long-term English language learners. And so, uh, you know, they're not five years is, is um, fifth grade if they've started in kindergarten. So there's not a long-term, not a lot of long-term ELL students in the elementary schools. But when we get to um, middle level campus and high school, you can see our, our, um, numbers there, 51 out of the 85 students at the middle level of campus have been in program five or more years. And then 51 out of the 71 students at the high school level have been in program five or more years. Doesn't mean they were in program in West Valley, right? Because we have a lot of movement. Um, but I would really like to see that number decrease. I'd like to see students exiting and testing proficient um, earlier than that. So, um, some goals that we have. I wanna increase awareness around the WIDA standards. With the new assessment come new standards. Um, those standards are tied to the content area, uh, to all the content areas, which I think will really help um, teachers. Uh, when we're a math teacher, we're not just a math teacher, we're a teacher of math language as well. 
And so understanding those standards and tying those to our content area will be really helpful. Uh, that's tricky, but we're gonna find ways to get some professional development time to do that for our teachers um, and for our students. I want to increase English language development in the general ed classroom. Uh, there are a few situations where you know, they might be pulled out into a lap room to have that English language development. I'd love to see that instruction being done by the classroom teacher, the teacher who knows those students best. And we have some already doing it, um, but I'd like to see that increase as well. Kindergarten multilingual uh, learners, proficient by third or fourth grade. That's just, I'm, feel, I'm really filling the poll to the K2. Um, if they start in kindergarten as an EL student, I'd really like to see, you know, some really, dedicated, intentional English language development happening, happening so we can, uh, students can test proficient uh, sooner rather than later, reducing the numbers of long-term ELs. And then just continue to view our multilingual learners through an assets-based lens um, and strengthening our relationships with them, providing the services and the supports that are um, necessary. And that's all. I have and it there it went okay so if you have any questions you can ask them now or obviously you can email me or call me uh in regard to the transitional bilingual program any questions from the board i i i was around seven or eight years ago and i'm fully impressed with how much more focused mm -hmm. our program has become we actually have a curriculum k what is it k9 k10 k12 k12, k12. we actually have a curriculum all the way through and and we didn't have that we it was it was very spotty in what we have i'm really impressed with what <clears throat> with what you put together and we had hoped that three years i think they always said three years to take to learn english language and you're exactly right we need to focus at elementary we don't we want to focus at elementary so we don't have long-term learners like after three years they're speaking english my last question, and this is the greatest thing, bilingual or dual language classrooms that has come up here. We do not, do not have dual language classrooms in West Valley. They, I don't know if Yakima still does or not. Is that something that has been talked about? Or I know there's positives and negatives about it. Is it something that we're even going to talk about? Or is it possible for West Valley to look at a dual language classroom? We actually haven't, uh, the three of us haven't had that conversation. I haven't been part of that with Peter and Stacy. Um, it's definitely something I would be in favor of, but I don't know that it's a, a reality. We haven't, we haven't even had the conversation. Um, I know there's a push from the state for dual language across schools, but I think you also have to look at um, just your capacity and your um, staffing, right, in order to sustain that and to grow that program. Because it's not just, kindergarten, it's every year thereafter that you have to build on that. So I think that that's where we pre it presents the challenge. Um, but thank you. And it is actually four to seven years. Uh, the research shows four to seven years to become fully proficient socially and academically in the language. So three years is really phenomenal. Pretty, pretty impressive. So. To piggyback on Mr. Jager's question, um, with dual language classroom, um, it's my experience that dual language classrooms are for the English language, um, the native English speaker, not for the native Spanish speaker. In your opinion, would you uh, would you like to see it where we are educating the native Spanish speaker in Spanish and then introducing the English so that there's that dual language rather than the opposite, which is the model that, that I see play out? So educating Spanish speakers in English first, and then as they learn the content more, transitioning over to English. Is that what I'm hearing you saying? So giving them the content in their native language and then adding to that. Right. So that's dual language is dual language classrooms right now are are classrooms, in my experience at least, are classrooms that are taught in Spanish to English speakers. Yeah, and, and I see it being beneficial to both English speakers and Spanish speakers. Um, I definitely think as a newcomer to the country, if I had the content in my home language, it definitely would make that transition easier. Um, 
it's it's a challenge for our kids, you know, to come in only speaking one language, uh, a different language other than English, and then having to learn the content. Um, so it would definitely be beneficial if they could have some instruction in Spanish. Right, and also my experience is or one of the other seven languages. Correct. Yeah, <laughs> it's, hard. it's also my experience that kids that that come into us that are monolingual Spanish speakers um, are disadvantaged with their education, whether they've been moving schools, countries, or whatnot. They haven't had the the uh, uh, they haven't been afforded, afforded the opportunities that many of our our kids have here. Right. So to be able to um, teach them in their na their native language would help them immensely compared to the opposite. My right. opinion. I have a, I have a, uh, uh, you actually answered with Kenny, you already answered one of my questions, <laughs> which was, tell me about what this uh, access and belonging look like in West Valley. And, and so the question got answered. Awesome. Uh, so that, that's great. My second question, um, I, I love the goals at the end. And you mentioned, my question is, is what do you think that it's going to take specifically to achieve those goals? I noticed that you briefly touched on uh, professional development. Is, 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 is that effectively the, the hallmark of, of what it's gonna take to reach those goals is, is professional development? Yeah, I think having more conversations around the needs of our multilingual learners and how we can support them in the classroom is really important. And we just um, need to increase the amount of opportunities we give teachers to have that conversation. Um, and also I just really feel strongly that long professional development at this point is not the answer. It needs to be small chunks, right? And so and we're just, we're all maxed out. And so the little tidbits that we can give here and there in an intentional conversation, whether that's a, a professional learning community opportunity with an instructional coach guiding their, their teaching, um, the more we can have those in job embedded learning happening, um, I think the more beneficial right now. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. On to item seven, which is public comment of non-discussion items. Um, I'm. I, I have. I have a list here of uh, three individuals that like that are the person that would like to uh, address the board, and I'm going to call on them first. Uh, while we're while we're doing that, uh, if there are any attendees online that would like to. Uh, speak during the public comment period, I'd ask that you raise your hand um, and we will uh, call on you um, after the in-person folks have had their shots. So we have three people. And first up is uh, Mrs. Knudsen. Um, as she's making her way up, uh, just a reminder that uh, we have allotted 30 minutes for public comment. And we uh, ask that, uh, Folks that are addressing the board, uh, keep their comments to five minutes, please. Go for it. Nope, I turned it off. My family and I arrived in Yakima in 1968. Our two daughters graduated from West Valley High School, and our four grandchildren have all attended schools here. Since 1980, I've been the choir accompanist for all of the choirs at the high school and junior high. 
I am proud and supportive of West Valley, but one of the concerns I have is about our lack of a dress code. In music, we, rec we recognize three composers whose names start with B, Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms. But in our choir room and in the halls and in the bathrooms, I've noticed that our girls have four Bs. Bras, bosoms, and belly buttons. Bras are worn instead of blouses and shirts. When they do wear blouses, way too much bosom is shown. There used to be ripped jeans. Now the holes are, are not around just the knees, but go all the way up to their underwear. Not only is this in, inappropriate for school, which is supposed to be a learning environment, but it's uncomfortable and a distraction for teachers and other students. And why are boys allowed to wear hats backwards and cowboy hats in the room? Another observation of mine is this Ram strong period, 25 minutes where students gather in small groups, sipping energy drinks, eating, playing on their phones and swearing as they sit in small clusters around the room. There is no important agenda for the day. If there is no important agenda for the day, why don't they just use this time to study? I may be a senior citizen, but I'm wise enough to know that decent clothing, not swearing, respect for oneself and respect for others makes for a better environment. And I hope that the school board and the faculty and the administration will consider a decent dress code for our students. Thank you all. Uh, I'll use my referee voice uh, inside my uh, ears up there. Uh, Mr. Matthews, would like to address uh, the school board. I can't hear you. So thank you. Um, I guess, first of all, thank you to the West Valley community for supporting the 2022 levy. This is the third campaign with a vote of support from our community. Um, Dr. Finch included in his report some of the numbers from, I believe, Thursday of last week. The final numbers were 4,309 votes to support. 3,941 votes um, voting no, we're passing rate at 52.23%. We often hear about, we often hear about the civics issue and how many people are showing up to vote. Uh, for West Valley in our community, that was 37.5% return rate, which actually is better than most of the other areas. However, to put that in perspective, a couple of notes um, to consider. That's about 600 or 700 additional no votes that we received in either 2018 or 2019 for the respective levy and bond. And about 900 fewer yes votes than in the 2019 bond. So it's, it's clear that we don't have as many voters truly showing up, and those that are are not showing up as yes votes. I want to specifically take the opportunity to thank a couple of board members. Uh, Mark Strong took four or five neighborhoods as the door hangers and a nice stack of signs. Uh, Dave Jagger saw an additional four or five neighborhoods. I think he wore out a pair of shoes, uh, took his own stack of signs and was there on the day to install the, uh, the big community signs um, on our corners. I want to thank uh, Michael Thorner for assisting with social media. Local for joining on a number of the Guardian Angel events. And I want to thank the district staff that were a part of the campaign in their off hours. Um, a number of staff joined our Guardian Angel events and were out and about waving signs of course. So we should recognize this as a very important levy in a very difficult climate, but we also should understand that there continue to be underlying issues that have to be resolved. And if we don't face those, understand those, and figure out a plan to resolve them, we're not going to have the success that our community needs, that our students need, that as West Valley, we would be proud to support. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And, and uh, finally, for in person, uh, Mrs. Harrison would like to address the board. I am the parent of a sophomore and seventh grader, and I reviewed 
the activity that parents were questioning and talking about at the last board meeting that was presented by ASB. I also read the response to public comment about this assignment and that this assignment was given to some students who felt bullied. This assignment was not about preventing bullying. It was an assignment that I feel would have been possibly more appropriate in a sex education class, not a RAM pride class. As a parent, I can opt out of sex education if I don't want my child learning some of these things presented in these articles. These were links to three different articles on the subject matter more appropriate for sex education. And I went to view these articles. There are at least 18 different links to different websites that my child or any other child that reviewed this assignment could have went to. My concern is how could I opt my child out of sex education information if it was presented in RAM Pride class? This activity was also labeled as equity and inclusion. My concern is can we expect more sex education activities to be covered in RAM Pride with equity and inclusion? Okay, uh, one last call for attendees uh, online that would like to address the school board. Okay, uh, seeing, seeing none, um, we'll go ahead and, and close the uh, public comment period and, and thank you uh, for the folks that spoke up this evening. On to... Um, Approval of consent agenda, um, as is usual in our business meeting, we have approval of minutes, vouchers and payroll, financial reports, employment contracts, uh, resignations, retirements and separations, as well as uh, leave requests. Um, at this time, does the school board have any uh, comments, uh, or I beg your pardon, questions uh, regarding the consent agenda? Hmm. Uh, Hearing none, I'll, I'll entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented this evening. So moved. Uh, I'll, uh, Mr. Meyer gets in just ahead of Mr. Moko. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take a vote. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, uh, motion carries four to zero. Next up, action items. Um, we have uh, approval of travel requests two and four. <laughs> One and three have been stricken. Um, we can take these as, as um, a group, um, but first uh, I'll offer up any questions that the school board may have for Dr. Finch. Uh, the PRTC overnight in East Valley, are we having to pay for um, overnight for a bus driver? Uh, no, no, it's local. So the bus driver is not gonna stay there. Okay. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay. Uh, if we're okay taking these as a group, uh, would somebody like to make a motion? I move to approve the travel request. Thank you, Mr. Jager. Uh, call for a vote. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, motion carries four to zero. Next up, we have approval of a collective bargaining agreement, and this is for the Principals Association, and it is uh, uh, their collective bargaining agreement for uh, mm -hmm. going through 2025, a four-year agreement. Dr. Kench, anything uh, further to add uh, to this? No, I just thought we're pleased to have a four-year agreement in place that'll give us stability in the district and um, you know consistency for our budgeting and planning. Okay, thank you. Um, anything else from the board members before we uh, take motion? I'll make a motion. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Mokel. Uh, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, motion carries for the principal CBA four to zero. Uh, uh, Item C, 9C is approval of resolutions, resolution 2202736, surplus of personal property. This is uh, something that we uh, undertake every year uh, for uh, 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 assets that are beyond depreciation 
in the district. So Dr. Right. Bush, anything else to comment? Well, just that this is also a special one because it deals with IT, which has uh, personal information in the computers, you know, systems and such. So it is not the regular surplus that we do. It's a special surplus for IT items. Mm. Thank you. All right, uh, so I will take a, a motion to approve resolution 2202-736, uh, surplus of personal property. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Meyer. Take a vote. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, uh, same sign. Motion carries four to zero. Items arising. None tonight. Okay. Uh, Dr. Finch reports. Just the standard reports there for enrollment, safety, travel log, and the high school ASB report. Very good. Superintendent's report. Well, Ryan Matthews stole my thunder because I was going to give the updated numbers, but certainly appreciate the support for the levy. Um, we can move forward again with consistency and um, planning for our next four years of our budget by having the, both the local funds and the state match that comes along with passing a local levy. I uh, certainly wanna give um, thanks to everyone who worked on supporting it, but specifically West Valley Citizens the Bear Schools and the work of Ryan Matthews, Michael Moore and Jerry Prescott, um, talking about when Ma Ryan was saying people at different meetings, they were at all the meetings <laughs> and they were, Jerry was at all the, all the ball games and uh, certainly appreciate uh, their families as well that were there. I know at all the meetings and uh, appreciate the support of the West Valley Citizens for Better Schools. Thank you, Dr. Finch. Uh, board reports and board development. Um, I had opportunity to attend the father-daughter dance. Um, this is the third year that I've been able to attend this with my daughter. Uh, we did run around town um, in lieu of a father-daughter dance and uh, accomplished some tasks one year. Um, I was so happy to see the number of people that came out to the event. Um, I can't guess how many people were here, a thousand people perhaps. Um, it was well attended, it was well run. Um, it was just exciting to see the, um, the joy of the kids and uh, with their dads at the event. Um, secondly, tomorrow night, um, I've been asked to judge for Mr. West Valley. Um, I'm hoping that that's well attended as well. Um, such a great outreach to our families in our community that are in need. And I know that the kids that uh, are involved in that, both um, as participants and coordinators, um, put in tons of time and tons of hours, and they need to be appreciated as well. So I'm excited to come and, and watch the show tomorrow night and, uh, and see what they've raised for our community. Um, so I, I just, uh, speaking of events that are upcoming, uh, I just like to put in a plug for Matilda, mm -hmm. which is the school district's musical, uh, next week. Uh, there's somebody that might be related to a board <laughs> member that is playing a pretty material part in the, uh, in the program. And, uh, but, uh, there she's in particular, very excited about, about the program. And, uh, it's just one of many things that, that has you know, we, we heard in the director's reports earlier tonight, something that is a common theme uh, about challenging times. And, and every day we're, we're getting back a little bit more back to, if you will, quote unquote, normal. Um, and things like musicals and Mr. West Valley in person and, and, and all of the wonderful programs that, that we're able to support for the activities. But I'm again, extremely proud and thankful for our staff who unlike other districts, we have remained in person. We have remained in person committed to learning, doing it as in a safe and effective environment as, as is possible during this time. And um, that is not unnoticed uh, by me. And I know it's not unnoticed by the school board members. So um, I'm very thankful, very thankful for our community and stepping up uh, during these times and supporting our levy, which is, should never be a foregone conclusion. And 
Mr. Matthews brings up excellent points about what these results communicate to us and we will take them seriously. So that that's all I have. This evening. And uh, with that, it is uh, 810. Thank you very much for coming this evening and we are adjourned. Thanks, everybody.